Right. Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing. I hope you're doing fine. This is our class in the anthropology of law, law and society. We shall be looking at some very important texts which are associated with the foundations of the discipline of legal anthropology, or more precisely, with the foundations of law in stateless societies and tribal kingdoms. Therefore, foundations of law and politics, and the beginnings of judicial institutions in indigenous societies. We shall draw on a text which is very well known in this scholarship by Max Gluckman, The Judicial Process Among the Barotse. This was a major monograph on procedures of dispute settlements in an indigenous society which was developed as the states. This was the kingdom of the Barotse peoples. I shall be uh, telling a, a bit more about this in a while. If time allows, we shall also tell a few things about the second reading by Paul Buchanan, which is entitled Drumming the Scandal Among the Teeth. Both of these texts are from a collection of essays by Paul Buchanan, which is edited by Paul Buchanan, and it is entitled Law and Warfare Studies in the Anthropology of Conflict. We have looked into this book in our previous classes as well, and we have read a, an essay by Leopold Pospisil, who is another important person, another important scholar in the 1950s, in this scholarship, which is concerned with social control and procedures of dispute settlement in indigenous societies in Africa or in Papua New Guinea. Now, as you might remember, for Pospisil, there are some basic attributes which are associated with law, or simply law is defined on the basis of several basic features. These attributes of law involve obligatio, an obligation to reciprocate, or an obligation to pay damages, or to um, uh, compensate in any way which is um, expected. There are other features or other attributes also, other attributes, in addition to obligation or obligatio in Latin. Law has regularity, as Pospisil says. Law has universal application, or it should have universal application. These are the basic features which define the presence of law, which define law as such. Now, Gluckman, as we shall find out, develops an interesting argument, which is, in a sense, unique. He shows that among the Barotsa peoples, one can find kinds of judicial reasoning, which are very similar to the ways that Western courts of law operate. This, is, this has very important implications for understanding the um, contents of law and legal procedures in societies which are uh, stateless or which have institutions which are very different from the sort of political and legal institutions which Western societies have. As I mentioned for Gluckman, the system of justice, the judicial system among the Barotse is based on rational principles, which one finds also in Western legal systems. This is a basic principle in this text, which we shall be looking at. Therefore, his approach to the study of law is rather different from Paul Bohannon's approach. The latter, the latter scholar argues that 
the concept of law is not relevant for studying processes of dispute settlements in indigenous societies. One reason for this is that one finds among the team in Nigeria, for instance, that there are ideas which are not part of the Western legal system, or they ceased to be part of the Western legal system for the past 300 years. I'm referring to witchcraft, sorcery, and various kinds of oracles, which were an important aspect of the trial of the decision process among this, among this indigenous community, among the Tif peoples, as well as among other indigenous African societies, as the, the Nuer peoples, referring to a famous work, a famous study by Evans Pritchard. Right, let's continue with the text and um, Today, um, I shall revisit this classical work by Gluckman, which I introduced in the previous class a few days ago, and I shall, I shall expound on these arguments by Gluckman, and I shall do so by means of looking at a very interesting case study, which is part of this text. Therefore, uh, in this lecture today, I shall elaborate on some arguments which I presented, which I introduced in the previous class, and I shall fortify these arguments on the basis of substantive data which come from Gluckman's own work. We shall review a very interesting case which comes from a local Kuta, a native court among the Barotse, and this is a case which, which is entitled the case of the biased father. This is very interesting. You can make a note and we shall return to this. What you see here is, uh, is, a, um, uh, is a, a collection of some basic works which um, everybody owes to read, especially those who are interested in this classical scholarship. On the left-hand side, this is the book which we are looking at today, Law and Warfare, Studies in the Anthropology of Conflict. The book in the middle is the, the monograph by Gluckman entitled The Judicial Process among the Barotze and Paul Bohannon's Justice and Judgment among the Tiv. I highly recommend all of these three works. They're fascinating readings and they are foundational texts in this subfield of legal anthropology which is concerned which is concerned with procedures of social control in indigenous societies right let me continue by telling a few things about gluckman although this is a rather incomplete introduction to gluckman's work there are some brilliant books which have been written regarding gluckman's uh, studies and his own theoretical and ethnographic um, background and his contributions. Therefore, what I'm offering here is just a very brief note, which I think that we need to consider in order to become familiar with some of the main with some of the major ideas in his work. On the right hand side, this is a another classic by Gluckman. Custom and Conflict in Africa. It was published in the 1950s or 60s, I think. Now, Blackman is mentioned as one of the founders of the Manchester School. This was a major theoretical perspective in British anthropology, and it was more influential from the 1950s until the 1970s and perhaps a bit later. This was a school which emphasized the study of procedures of dispute settlements, as well as the study of social conflicts. Therefore, the sort of orientation which this school uh, bring, which this school brought forward, was rather different from the classic structure functionalist paradigm which dominated British anthropology at that time. Yes, I mentioned below some of the major 
features of this school in anthropology, and these features also emerge from Gluckman's writings. This school emphasized the study of social change, the relationship between religion, rituals, and the social order, the inner dynamics of indigenous societies. Further on, the scholars of this particular perspective were focusing on the implications of age sets and cross-cutting loyalties, especially the implications of these social formations for the maintenance of the social order or the, uh, the role of these formations, especially in cases of conflicting social interests. An individual was a member of a lineage and at the, and at the same time, the same individual was a, member of, uh, was a member of an age group or any other kind of social group. And this, in a sense, this um, participation, this dual membership provided a basis for stability, for the maintenance of the social equilibrium. Gluckman, of course, is associated with studies of tribal politics, with chiefs, chiefdoms, and headmen, and overall with a maintenance of the social e equilibrium. Of course, in his work, he focuses on law and legal procedures in African societies. One of his early works is a one of his early works which introduces questions of ethnicity in South Africa and he is his 1940 essay entitled The Bridge Analysis of a Social Situation in the Zululands. In his writings, he develops an advanced structure functionalist approach which places equal importance on social conflicts and an underlying structural equilibrium. In African social systems, individuals function as the reasonable incumbents of a, of a social position, of social positions who are intent on maintaining the social order. Gluckman is especially known and widely known for having written some seminal essays which are um, cited, which have been cited um, many times and of course, I can only mention a couple of these, and the titles are indicative of the spirits and the substance which one finds in these brilliant essays. The Peace in the Feld, The Frailty in Authority, and The License in Ritual. These three essays are part of a collection of papers which were written by Gluckman, and they were, they were all published as, as papers in the same volume. Right, um, yes, this is a map which we saw in the previous class also. This is the region which is part of our, um, of our examination. We are looking into this region, the Barotse land. It was part, it is part of Rhodesia, now Zambia, the state of Zambia. In the southern part of Africa. On the right hand side, this should be a picture showing the uh, public life and various public, uh, public activities among the Barotsa peoples in the first decades of the 20th century. Right, I shall um, inevitably repeat some of the information which I mentioned in the previous class as an introduction to the ethnographic specifics of our class today. We shall be looking at some basic information on the social organization and the political and legal institutions of the Barotsa peoples. The Lotsi peoples are the dominant tribe, the dominant community among the Barotse. They are the ruling people of Barotse land. And I should mention perhaps that I am using ethnographic present, uh, ethnographic present tense 
as I do not know whether the situation has changed ever since, I would expect that things are very different nowadays. Therefore, I'm referring, I'm always referring to Gluckman's text, which involves ethnographic data which were collected during fieldwork in the 1940s, during a period of 30 months among the Lhotse peoples, who are the dominant, the ruling people of Barotse lands. This importance of the Lhotse peoples is explained by a myth which concerns the origins of the Barotse, or perhaps this myth is not just um, a, a, an exclusive possession of, 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 of the Lhotse peoples, it refers general to the Barotse. This concerns the genesis of the first kingdom, which was created by a male descendants of gods. The uh, Barotse term for gods is Nyambe. This divine king, this first king who emerged, was a law giver. He was the one who conceived the law according to this myth of origins. He gave the law to the people. And this first law is what the Barotse have today, or the meaning of law as such has um, survived ever since, um, since the, the, the origins of these peoples. Law is a body of rules which defines obligations and rights, as well as procedures for seeking justice from the king. This law came into existence after the foundation of this kingdom. The Lodzi believe that this law as a body of rights and justice or truth as they define justice has existed from time immemorial. The kingdom of the Lodzi peoples was well established by the mid 19th century and extended its dominion over adjacent Barotse peoples. As Glockman says, as he writes, the Barotse nation is a conglomerate nation. I think that what he means by that is that it involves various different units, the Lotse peoples and other peoples. Yet, nonetheless, it is a nation in the literal sense, in the literal sense of the term. It has a governmental political organization. It has a central government, a hierarchy of courts, a court system. And also it's, it has all the means available for enforcing decisions and law. At that time, this region was occupied by the uh, British South Africa Company, which was established in the beginning of the 20th century. This region was a protectorate of Britain. It was part of the colonial of the colonial system of the British Empire. This company, the British South Africa, South Africa Company, had been established for the purposes of colonization, economic exploitation around the Zambezi River, and also it held policing functions. It had the power to enforce the law. Gluckman mentions that the native courts which were occupied, which were controlled by the Barotsa peoples, had lost much of their power because of this change, because of the imposition of the British colonial rule. They could no longer try cases of witchcraft, just as they could no longer try important cases or serious cases involving crimes. For instance, they had lost their power to try crimes belonging to the following categories. Cases punishable by death or life imprisonment. Cases relating to witchcraft. Witchcraft was not sanctioned as a crime by the British colonial system. And there is much recent literature in the anthropology of African witchcraft, which shows how this absence of uh, legal decisions on witchcraft accusations during the colonial periods was perceived as a cause 
for the proliferation of witches during these colonial periods. This has its implications for the post-colonial periods and the, uh, the rise of witchcrafts and the rise in number of witch hunts in various parts of Africa as in South Africa. And of course, there are some brilliant works, some recent works by Jean and John Komarov, which demonstrate this tendency. Right, yes. At the same time, native courts had acquired the power to imprison. Therefore, native courts had lost important functions, which were part of the tribal customary law, just as they had gained some new functions. One of these being the power to imprison. The, the idea of imprisonment was perhaps foreign to these peoples, these peoples traditionally. Right? Yes. Let me continue, please, with um, some uh, sentences on the pre-colonial political and juridical organization of the Lhotse peoples. There were two capitals before 1890 in this kingdom. The main capital, which was ruled by the king, a male king, and a second capital in the south, which was ruled by a prince's chief. The, um, the sort of information which Gluckman gives at this point in his paper is very limited, but I'm sure that he has discussed this in other works. So I uh, will not tell anything further about this, although this sort of dual kingship sounds extremely interesting and it is worth searching about this further. The capital was a city which included a palace, the council house, which was a courthouse, or the courthouse, the latter was called Kuta in the native language. This was a court of law. The Kuta, Kutas is the plural, as it is given by Gluckman himself. The Kuta among the Lodzi was highly organized in accordance with ideas about rank and seniority and personal distinction. At some point in his text, Gluckman says that the logic of this judicial procedure is based on, on ideas of objectivity. A judge is expected to be fair, impartial, and objective in his judgments. Moreover, Glockman says that the uh, ideas, that the, the idea, the idea of property ownership as such is very important. And although, although all the lands, all the lands belongs to the king, formally speaking, the judges are careful enough to apply the law and to respect the rights of the people who occupy their own pieces of land and they cultivate these pieces of land. Therefore, what this means is that essentially there is no distinction or there is no difference in the way that the uh, typical Lodzi judge perceives the king and a commoner, a peasant, or a commoner, a simple person. Right, yes, the head of the Kuta is called Gambela in the native language, and his position, his mat, is next to the king. Now, another important feature, which is a symbolic feature among the Lhotse peoples, is the mats as such, which is which was placed as a seat. This was the, every, every Lhotse judge was sitting on a mat. And if a person, if a position vacated, the mat remains because persons leave one after another, but the office remains. Therefore, a, a position which was vacated would be filled by 
a successor by another by another person who would play the role of a judge, who would become a judge, who would take part in this jury. Right, yes. Now, I shall be referring to procedures of cross-examination in the process, the lots of peoples had a highly developed procedure of cross-examination and verification of all evidence. They were obsessed with evidence and there were procedures for verifying that a person is telling the truth and that a person is not protected by secret medicines um, at the expense of taking the oath. This does emerge at some point in the text. And I think that I mentioned this below, but I shall mention this now, just in case I do not mention this because it's quite important. The, the idea existed that the idea existed that a person who was tried could protect himself by um, taking secret medicines. And these medicines protected him from, uh, from being discovered as a, as a culprit. Therefore, these medicines, in a sense, cancelled the power of the oath, which every litigant should take in front of the judge or in front of the king. In a sense, the, the oath or the, the procedure of the procedure of cross-examination and the oath also were equivalent to a kind of lie detection device and a person had his own way to eschew this, this, um, this kind of official control by taking some kind of secret medicine, in a sense by using witchcraft or magic consuming a kind of medicine as a magical potion and in a sense concealing his real person or hiding a crime or a delict which he committed. Right, so the judges were aware of this, were aware of this possibility and this does emerge somewhere in this ethnographic case which we shall consider and which is entitled The Biased Father. It does emerge, please read the text very carefully, and you shall see this sort of warning by a judge of this cuter, which concerns this case study. It's a fascinating moment, which further enhances and further affirms Gluckman's argument about the rationality of the Lodzi judicial procedures. Right, yes. So in a sense, it was a kind of policing and it was based on rational principles. Yes, right. Decisions on each case are expressed by each of the councillors in ascending order of seniority, as I mentioned. I have summarized some of the major ideas of the, which, which Blockman uh, discusses in his text. The judgment is then referred to the ruler of the capital who confirms, rejects, or alters it. Moreover, Gluckman says that the king himself has, of course, the absolute right to be present at every cuta, and he has the right to issue his own decision. Now, it is important to establish that the social relationships which are being discussed and evaluated in these cutas are multiplex relationships as Gluckman defines them. What does he mean by that? A way to understand this is to go one step further and consider what Gluckman says about the narrow concept of relevance and the wider concept of relevance, which is associated with the Lodzi jurisdiction. He argues, and he rightly argues, that 
lots of judges employ a wider a, a concept, a wider conception of relevance when adjudicating in, in their decisions, in making decisions. And they do so because it is all kinds of social relationships which under the field of the law courts. This is different from what happens in Western law courts. And this is something which Simon Roberts also discusses in the introduction of his book, which is entitled Order and Disputes, an introduction to legal anthropology. Simon Roberts also refers to this concept. The Western courts, the courts, the courts narrow concept of relevance. This means that aspects of the dispute which do not bear upon the conflict as such are not relevant to the procedure and they are excluded. Among the lots of peoples, it is completely different. There are no written laws, although there is a clearly defined body of normative principles. And there is also a recognition that there exists a sort of legal precedence the Lotsi judges were operating with this kind of legal precedent in mind, just as they operated on the basis of non-written, non-written normative principles which people should abide by. Therefore, a way to understand this particular kind of Lotsi jurisdiction is to employ the concept of the reasonable man, the concept of the morally upright person. This is the ideal kind of normative behavior among the Lodzi, the son who is respectful for his father, who shows respect for his father, the father who is um, a caring person and a considerate and a conscientious person. Anything else which is not part of this ideal relationship, is condemned as an immoral act, and it is punished according to the uh, normative principles which the Lhotse people had at that time. Nonetheless, it is important to establish at this point that the purpose of the Lhotse court is not so much punitive or retaliatory. The purpose is not to inflict punishment and retaliation. Instead, the purpose is to reconcile the two parties and to avoid the breakup of the lineage or, or the breakup of the homesteads, to maintain the social equilibrium. Right, thanks. Thanks very much. Yes, therefore, this is an important argument. The court's conception of relevance is wide in this local court of law. Right, excuse me, yes. Now we shall consider this case in the process. They, uh, the cases which invite this sort of wider concept of relevance are cases of conflict between blood king and fellow villagers. Glockman says, he writes, that the Lhotse people are very litigious, and this also conforms to the stereotype or the standard of African peoples as being very litigious and of African, traditional African litigiousness. Paul Bohanan also describes the Tif peoples as highly litigious. People may be compelled to file a lawsuit out of holding a grudge against someone about trifling incidents in the past, or they may shoot someone, they may file a lawsuit, knowing that they will lose 
but they do so because they want to expose someone in a public trial. These are the rational motives for, for um, prosecuting someone, for taking a case to the public tutor. All grievances are examined against the norms of behavior expected of people. But as I said, punishments is not vindictive and the purpose of this judicial system is not to inflict punishments, uh, but to um, admonish people and to show what the right behavior is. Therefore, the Barotze judgments are essentially sermons, sermons on filial, parental or brotherly love, filial piety, parental and brotherly love. Now, I introduced the concept of the reasonable man, which Gluckman finds that is very important in this judicial system. This concept among the Lotzi peoples describes the upright man. And further on, it implies that moral issues are barely distinguish, distinguishable from legal issues. An important aspect of this concept of the reasonable man is the nature of disputes in the context of multiple multiplex relationships. Essentially, all relationships relate, pertain to politics and kinship. A person comes to court not as a right and duty bearing persona, but in terms of his total social personality. There is not simply in terms of the injured party and the wrongdoer. This leads Blockman to argue that the Lotzi judicial process is similar to the process in Western law. Right, yes. Glockman sees the judicial process either in the Lodzi courts or in Western jurisprudence as the attempt to specify legal concepts with ethical implications according to the structure of society in application to the great variety of circumstance of life itself. The Lotzi courts of law dealt with a range of disputes which affected land, cattle, social position, marriage, succession, theft, assault, and slander, defamation. The judicial reasoning is embedded in indigenous Lotzi institutions and thought. Gluckman asserts that Lotzi jurisdiction depicts modes of reasoning which are universally found in circumstances where people apply norms to varied disputes. He writes specifically that these principles of judicial reasoning can be found in the arbitral processes of societies without governmental institutions. Therefore, if one looks at the Barotze judicial system, one finds a range of normative principles which should be universal, which are found also in societies which do not have centralized systems of governance, which do not have gover governments. Right, yes. Now, as I mentioned, this research which we are examining, which we are looking at, was carried out in the years between 1940 and 1947. This, this fieldwork involved the collection of ethnographic data during 30 months between 1940 and 1947. Gluckman says that the judges try to affect conciliation of the parties. Judges are not restricted by concepts of irrelevant evidence. Now let us look at a case study which is extremely interesting and it involves all of these arguments and, and, and ideas which I mentioned so far. This is the case of the biased father. 
This case concerns a land dispute between a kin group and fellow villagers. It was heard on the 27th of August, 1942. Blackman was present and he recorded the facts. As you can see, this, the, as you can see, the diagram shows the major, the dramatis personae, the, the, the persons who are involved in these disputes. This, um, I've taken this from the, from Blackman's essay, and uh, we shall return to this text in the next slide. Let me explain what happens here, and then I shall continue with the text in order to explain the events of this very interesting case. Yes, this is a genealogical tree. This person is the headman. Y is the headman. These are his brothers and sisters. This is K, is Y's brother, is the headman's brother. K was no longer alive when this case was taken to the courts. Let's look at this part of the genealogical tree. These are K's children, A, B, and C. These three persons are the appellants, A, B, and C. C was not present in court, plaintiffs in original shoot. These were the plaintiffs, A, B, and C. They filed a low shoot against the headman, against Y. Nonetheless, Y was their own father or their own, their own paternal uncle. Exactly because the biological, their biological father was absent. He had died a long time ago. It was the headman. It was their own uncle who undertook everything about their upbringing. It was the, the headman who brought them up. Right? They were raised, they were, these people, A, B, and C, they were raised by this person, by Hedman Y. At the same time, this Hedman had his own children, Z and V. These are his biological children. These are the respondents or the defendants in original shoot, Y, Z, and V. Therefore, this case concerns A, B, and C, who turned themselves against the headman and his, and his two sons, especially Z. We shall find out why. This is a complex case, and it does deserve a treatment in accordance with a wider concept of relevance, as we shall see. Right, ABC shoot their father, father's elder brother, the village headman, for allegedly taking over their gardens on the margin of a small plain. According to the laws of the Barozza, if a person leaves his natal village, he loses his rights on land and property. I've written so much text, I, I must explain this. I've written so much text exactly because the case was so complex and it's contains so many details. And at the same time, Blockman's argument, especially his conclusions were quite complex. And I felt that I should um, write down um, as much as possible, or I should present this um, in detail. Yes, right. As I said, this diagram um, is, the original diagram is in, uh, Blackman's text. The primary cause of this tension between A, B, C, and the family of the headman was an incident of adultery between Zeds, between the headman's son and the wife of C. Yes, keep in mind that C, this person was not present in the trial. This was a case of adultery between Z and the wife of C. This person, C, found out about this, this affair and, of course, he did not like this at all. He injured Z. He injured 
this, this person, the headman's son, C did not pay damages to Z for this as he owed to, as he owed to. He should have paid damages for injuring him, but he did not do so. C complained to Y, to his own father, yet Y, the headman, no, excuse me, C, yes, C, C, the person whose wife entered an affair with Z. C, complained to the headman, to his uncle and his, his um, stepfather, his, his, uh, his uncle, yes. He complained to his uncle, to the headman, and yet why headman drove him out of the village. The three brothers leave the village after accusing Z, after accusing Z of cultivating their land, and they lodged a complaint to an Induna. An Induna is a judge, just like the members of this tutor, they're called Induna. This Induna who received this complaint was out of this village. And this person, the latter person, opines, opines that they lost their lands. In other words, he told these three, these three brothers, as long as you no longer live in this village, you are losing your lands. You lost your land because according to the law, according to the law, you have to be present. You have to be present, you have to live in your village. Otherwise, your land is confiscated or it is taken away. It is taken by other, other relatives. Right, yes, so, this is what the problem is. The land, the land was taken by uh, other members of their own family as they left the village. However, yes, the latter opines that they lost the land. A, B, C, the three brothers argued that Y was deciding with partiality and that he was supporting his own son, Z, his own son. The latter person, Z, claimed that if A, B, and C had not left their village, their children and domesticated animals would enter his own gardens too. This would even each other's acts. That's a very interesting logic of reciprocity and compensation. Therefore, what this person means is that if these three persons were present, their own children and their own domesticated animals would also enter my own fields and, and we would be even and there would be nothing to debate, there would be no dispute. Now let's see the actions taken by this tutor and what the kind of judicial reasoning is, what the logic of this judicial procedure is. The tutor, the law court calls the headman, headman Y, who launched a diatribe, noting how ungrateful younger people were. Remember what Glockman says about the normative principles and the concept of the reasonable and the morally upright person. Every litigant, all those who are adversaries in the court of law, are intent on showing that they are in the rights, that they are morally upright persons, and that um, although, they, although their, their actions were beneficial, other people wronged them. This is what this person says here. But these young people were so unjust because they did not show any respect for elderly people. Yes, further on, Hedman Y claims that he made several attempts to approach them again. And at the same time, he responds to various rumors of planting medicines in the gardens of A, B, and C, in the gardens of these three brothers. These brothers believed that this was the case, that this was happened because somebody hated them. In any case, there was much tension in the village and 
this dispute had occult ramifications also. This is an example of multiplex relationships and their impact on the Barotze judicial system. The red line, red is the right color for this sort of affair. This line shows the adultery, the affair between the wife of C and this person, the son of the headman. Also, the defendants responded to this accusation. Z confessed that this was the case. He accepted that he entered an affair with uh, the wife of uh, this person and that this was not appropriate. But at the same time, at the same time, pay attention to his justification for this. He's trying to encompass this affair, this illicit affair, within a wider context of relationships, which justifies Gluckman's definition of this context as multiplex relationships. He says that there is one of these respondents, one of these respondents claims that A, one of the appellants, had provided support to the son of the sister of Hedman. There is A, had provided support to the son to the son of the sister of the headman, either this or this. These two round figures correspond to the sisters of the headman. Therefore, one of these persons had provided support to the son, to the son of the sister of headman. What this means is that this person undertook to provide support as a father to provide support as a hypothetical father to the son of one of these sisters, even if this sister was married to someone else, right? So in a sense, what these persons are saying here is that although A had no responsibility, had no obligation to get involved in another marriage and to present himself as a protective person, as a, pro as a protective father, he did so. And he functioned as a substitute for the husband of this woman, of this person here, for the husband of this woman. Therefore, in a sense, a precedent exists. And in a sense, somehow this justifies or this mitigates the... Um, the <clears throat> the illicit affair, the violation, the transgression, which was committed by Z. That was the logic of this uh, argument, right? So I think that this is extremely interesting because it shows that there were complex and very rational kinds of argumentation in this society, especially in cases of adultery. Well, yes, one may say that the justification of adultery is a universal, a universal kind of mentality. Right, uh, yes. Right, yes. Let me continue with this and we shall close the first part in a while. Now, let me continue with the procedure of this CUTA. The defendants are called to give evidence. What follows is a procedure of cross-examination. Further witnesses are called by a senior in Duna. Since the disputing parties, the disputing parties present different accounts of why this family breakup, why this family breakup happens, and why this removal from the village happens. After a lengthy examination, all the members of the court express their opinions regarding the wrongdoings done by both parties in this dispute. Several judges criticize the headman's lack of support for his, for his children, for his nephews, but the headman affirms 
but they're welcome to return. Greece, the morally upright person. Several judges inform A, B, and C that they cannot lay claims to their lands as long as they no longer live in the village. They urge the disputants to finish this quarrel and to pray and to pray together to, the, to their ancestral spirits. An aspect of these disputes, which especially displeased the jury, were the allegations of sorcery made by the three brothers against Y and his biological children. Y had instead argued, the headman had instead argued that the crops had been scorched by the sun, not by medicines allegedly planted in the garden, as the, three as the three brothers had claimed. One of the judges attributes rebellious motives to A, to one of the brothers, accusing him of wanting to become an independent head of the group, possibly meaning a headman. Finally, the litigants are asked to give the royal salute, according to which the successful litigant acknowledges that he has received justice. This is important because this symbolism shows that the court had wanted both parties to be successful and that they should reconcile with each other. Therefore, both parties are successful and both parties have to present the royal salute in front of the magistrate and the jury, right? Therefore, right, let's conclude with some propositions about the nature of the lawsy judicial reasoning. We are concerned with some standards and normative principles. The standards which are publicly stated for the parties are the norms involved in their social positions and relationships. This is the essence of Lodzi judicial process. There is stating the normative principles of behavior and assessing against them the behavior of the parties in a specific situation. The court extended its standards of evidence to encompass a series of broader, of broader a series of broader moral issues which are involved in the family disputes. Lodzi judicial process corresponds with Western judicial procedures. The reasonable man is present, of course, in this case. He is acting sensibly and conforming to custom. And also, also this concept emerges here in the sense of a particular reasonable and customary incumbent of any social position. Gluckman concludes that the normative principles show, that, show the presence of ethical psychology in these judgments. The standard of the reasonable and morally upright individual is the functional equivalent of such technologies for establishing for establishing guilt or innocence as the techniques of detectives, police officers, fingerprinting and blood or DNA tests. I think this is a, a, an appropriate way of finishing this very interesting exposition what this ethnography shows, in addition to this argument on the reasonableness and the rationality of this judicial system, is that certain procedures of cross-examination and the treatments of the concepts of the extended relevance, of wider relevance, might bring about results which can be possible, which are normally possible by means of such procedures as um, policing and techniques used by detectives or even fingerprinting and other procedures which are part of the forensic science. Right, let me terminate this first part here and we shall continue with the second part in a while.